All right, let's just read from Matthew 13, verse 33 to 35. Uh, another spa parable spake he unto them. Uh, oh, wait, not 33. 30. I wanted to read this one. 31 to 33, sorry. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. So what I want to talk about this morning um, is just the topic of leaven. And we'll look at um, you know, what leaven is, just tell you, tell you a bit about what I know about leaven. Um, we'll look at three types of leaven to be aware of in the Bible. And um, it, it's a very interesting topic because there's a lot of spiritual applications to leaven that I don't know whether you've realized. Um, so we'll, we'll make a couple of those applications and hopefully it's, it's interesting for you. But, but what is leaven, first of all? Leaven, leaven is typically another word for yeast. So it's, it's like something you add to a bread um, to make it, uh, make it rise. Now, nowadays, people who make bread, like the, the real way you'd make bread, you'd, you'd capture these wild yeast and you'd make a sourdough type bread. Um, but nowadays when people make yeast, they use what's called baker's yeast. You know, when you think about making bread, you buy your, your flour and everything like that. And then you go to the store and you buy baker's yeast. And then you add that to bread and it makes it rise. This is not the, the real type of leaven. The, the baker's yeast that you buy in the store, uh, what they've basically done is they've created uh, or, or, or manufactured this one strain of yeast. And I think it devours like a, a very little amount of sugar and it creates a very consistent rise. Um, but it's not the real yeast, it's, it's very different. So they've got this one strain um, that doesn't alter really the flavor of the, the, uh, of the flour or the bread, but it produces a lot of carbon dioxide and very consistently. And that's why people like to use that baker's yeast because you add it to the flour and you get a very consistent rise, a very consistent loaf. The problem with it is because it doesn't do what real leaven does, it, it, it's actually not very good for you. Um, as far as I've read anyway, I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but um, as far as what I've read, you know, the, the baker's yeast that they put into bread, it, it can um, sort of promote um, yeast infection and thrush in ladies and things like that. Um, also, it doesn't break down um, like the, the proteins and pre-digest the proteins and, and, and break down as much sugar. So it doesn't um, leave the bread in as healthy a state because it's not pre-digested. Whole grains in, in breads, um, in wheat, have something called, called phytic acid. Um, this is what I've read on the internet. So phytic acid actually takes minerals from your body. So when bread is properly leavened, um, it actually removes that phytic acid and it's actually a lot, the bread is a lot healthier. Um, that's why sourdoughs are really good for you and they keep a lot longer. But when the phytic acid is not removed and you eat a lot of grains, it actually draws a lot of minerals from your body. But, you know, this is just one of those things where, you know, when you read in the Bible, the love of money is the root of all evil. It's just another one of those things where people have, you know, they've created this yeast so they can sell bread. Because when you go to the store, you would rather a bread that you know is going to be fluffy and the same every time. So they know that. So this is a sort of bread that sells rather than bread that's, you know, harder to chew, um, is less consistent. You know, you, when you buy sourdough bread, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's uh, more dense than others because it, the bacteria and the yeast that is used to actually ferment sourdough is alive. It's real um, and it's inconsistent because it changes with temperature and different parts of the world and all sorts of things. Um, but because it's the real type of leaven, you know, they, they can use that in bread and they can take a bit of that and put it in a new lump of bread and just keep using it for lifetime over lifetime of different bakers. Whereas you think about baker's yeast, when you put it into bread, you can only use it for that loaf of bread and then it's over. So it's a totally different type. So when we think of yeast, it's not really the baker's yeast um, that the Bible's talking about. It's talking about this, this other type of leaven, which is the real leaven. And unfortunately, just things in our world, um, you know, because of the love of money, um, people create food that isn't really good for us. And when I was thinking of this point, I actually got a bit convicted because I was thinking, okay, maybe I should start buying better bread for our church to eat on Sundays because we just buy like the cheap, you know, bread that, that you get from Coles. Maybe we'll start buying some, you know, spelt or buckwheat sourdough or something to make our hamburgers with. Uh, it's not actually that much more expensive. Um, okay, so that, that's, what, that's what leaven is. And, you know, in the right conditions... Um, 
it spreads and multiplies from a small amount. And that's what we read here in Matthew 13, in verse 33. He says, another, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. So she's put it into this, this dough, right? Till the whole was leavened. So you see how this little bit of leaven, when it's added to this lump of dough, actually leavens the whole dough. Uh, and that's what we learn about leaven. And that's actually how it works. And we see other verses in the Bible, which we're going to turn to in a, in a moment. You've probably heard, you know, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Um, now, even though, even though in the Bible, leaven is used to represent something negative in the Bible, um, that doesn't mean it's inherently sinful. You know, like even the Bible talks negatively about dogs, but dogs are not sinful. Like if you have a dog, it's not like you have something that's on the devil. Even though, you know, reprobates and things like that are referred to as dogs, it doesn't mean your physical dog is a, is a reprobate. Um, same with swine, you know, cast not your swap pearls before swine. There's nothing wrong with pigs. It's just that pigs are used as a physical example to represent something spiritual. So it's the same with leaven. Even though leaven is used negatively in the Bible, um, it's not sinful, inherently wrong in and of itself. And actually adding um, leaven to bread is a fermentation process. So a fermentation process is when bacteria and yeast you know, break down substances chemically in a food, whether it's sugars and proteins, uh, and, and um, change the flavor and develop vitamins and minerals, uh, vitamins in, in, that, um, in that food. So adding leaven or adding yeast and, and bacteria to a food is actually a good process in the real world. So it's interesting that in the Bible, um, even though it's, a, it's, a, it's, talked, it's used to represent something negative, it's used to represent sin and false doctrine and how that can leaven a whole lump. In reality, it's actually a very good and healthful process um, in the real world. And, and I use the word healthful. I don't know if you guys realize, you know, we say like a food is healthy. So supposedly I read on the internet that that's the wrong way to describe things. If something is healthy, it means it's in good health. So we would say, I am healthy. But you'd say a food is, it's not a healthy food because the food is not healthy or sick. You'd say that it's a healthful food, meaning that it's a food that's healthy for you. I don't know. So some people, you know, you read on the forums and they're like, oh, this is a healthy food. And they're like, no, it's healthful, not healthy. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it, actually leaven is, is, is a healthful thing in the real world because it actually makes food uh, better. Um, so that's what fermentation is. And, and fermentation is used to create foods like kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, um, things like that, which are, which are really good. And, you know, a lot of people these days, because we don't, we have refrigeration and we have, um, you know, uh, the, the, the industrial revolution that can create a lot of food very easily. Nowadays, we don't eat a lot of foods raw. We don't eat a lot of fermented foods because we have refrigeration. And that's why nowadays a lot of people experience gut problems where they've got intolerances to things and they have eczema and, and all these different you know, irritable bowel syndrome um, because we eat all these foods and we eat a lot of grains and things like that that are not fermented and not soaked. And supposedly it destroys your intestines and that's why a lot of people have those problems. Um, and it just goes to show because of sometimes for modern conveniences, it actually is destroying our food. So it is, I would definitely encourage you guys, if you don't know, to look into fermented foods, um, look into things that can heal that gut because a lot of uh, things actually destroy your gut health. Um, and that's why we, we hear a lot more about like probiotics and things like probiotics and prebiotics because it's all about rebuilding your gut health and um, helping you to be healthier. And you know, funny story about how, how I actually came across fermentation, you know, we, we buy um, raw milk. So raw milk is milk from cows that is, um, is not pasteurized. So pasteurize, pasteurization is when, you know, milk is heated to destroy the bacteria in, in milk. Now, there, there's obviously a debate over whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to do. I'm on the side that it's a bad thing to do because even though you destroy the bad bacteria in the milk, you also destroy the good bacteria. And because Probably before, I mean, I don't even know when the laws were put in place, but probably before when people didn't take care of cows and, you know, with the Industrial Revolution and things like that, um, the milk did have bad bacteria. But, you know, you can only drink uh, unpasteurized milk from cows that are organically raised and, and feeding on grass. But now they feed cows, you know, grain and they, and they pump them full of hormones. Obviously, the milk is not going to be the quality it needs to be. So in order to combat that, was it William Pasteur, I think his name was, created the pasteurization technique to you know, uh, heat the temperature up to 40 or 50 degrees or something to destroy the bacteria. 
Um, but what that actually does is it makes the, the milk devoid of the good bacteria that is actually found in cow's milk from the, from the grass. Um, it also, some people think it actually changes the chemical composition of the protein and that's why a lot of people um, experience milk intolerance. But um, raw milk is like yogurt. Raw milk that is unpasteurized and, and gotten from cows that are organically raised and fed on grass actually has that good bacteria in it. And when you drink it, it actually helps you to digest the lactose. So unfortunately, you know, it's, it's actually illegal in Australia to sell raw milk as a food. So the way they get around the law is they sell it as a bath product, as a cosmetic product, and you can buy it and people drink it anyway. And now they're trying to stop us even more from, from buying healthy milk because they're trying to get the farms that sell unpasteurized milk to add a bittering agent in it so people can't drink it. So this is just how tyrannical, you know, the Food and Drug Association is in Australia. They're just trying to make decisions. I mean, why can't people just make decisions for themselves? I mean, you know, nobody's stopping you from eating shampoo or things like that. But then they have to, you know, they have to put these regulations on food because they pe think people are too silly to make decisions for themselves. And, you know, sometimes churches are like that, aren't they? Sometimes churches are the type where they're trying to regulate the thought life of everyone in church. They're trying to regulate the conversation because they're a bit like the Food and Drug Association. They want to regulate what everyone's eating rather than, you know, allowing the Holy Spirit to help people to decide what is right and wrong. Um, we can make these decisions ourselves. I mean, God has given us um, His wisdom directly. You know, we don't need somebody to mediate for us to decide what, what we can and can't eat. We have the wisdom from above. Um, so anyways, uh, so, so, so we, we, drink, we drink raw milk. You can get it from a couple of places in Australia still, but you know, I would definitely encourage you to, to, to I'm, I'm all for raw milk, and the more people that buy it, the cheaper it's going to get, and, the, and maybe we can change that law, right? Because right now it's like $9, $10 for two litres, um, just because it's, there's not much demand for it, because not many people know about it. So we drink raw milk, and the way I can actually, so this is what I got, this is where I'm coming to. The way, the way we found, I found out about fermented foods is because we, we get our raw milk delivered by like an on, on, online organic grocery company. And when we were living in Hillsdale, the, the, the courier driver accidentally delivered our milk to the wrong apartment. So he actually delivered it next door. So when I called them, I was saying, you know, I still haven't got my everything. And so they sent it again because they're like, oh, you know, well, you've got milk in there. So that's we just send it again. So, so we got it again. And then I figured, well, I'll, I'll oh, no, no, what happened? Did our, did our neighbor come over and said, how, how, did we find, how did we find out that it was next door? I, I can't remember. Anyway, we found out it was next door and I figured, well, if, if you know, because even though the milk might not be good anymore, the vegetables and everything would still be good, so I'll still get that and use it. So we, we, we took our food back and then um, the, the, food ha the, the milk had gotten warm. But when I smelt it, it didn't smell like regular milk. Because you know when regular milk goes off, it, gets, it goes pungent and rancid and really disgusting. Whereas this one smelled kind of sour, so I was thinking, oh, maybe I've, I've heard things about, you know, fermented drinks and things like that. So I thought I'd look up, is it, is it safe to drink soured raw milk? And then I read all this stuff about once raw milk actually sours, it's actually better for you because it's actually fermented. Because raw milk has the bacteria and the yeast in it from the cows, that normal milk that you buy from the store pasteurized has all been killed. See, that goes off because it's devoid of all the bacteria and yeast. But raw milk, if you leave it in the bottle and allow it to, quote unquote, like go off, it'll actually ferment and it'll sour and it'll turn into an act actually a healthier drink. So that's when we started making fermented milk and fermented kefir. And we're like looking at it, now we're doing fermented like cabbage and all sorts of stuff. So it was a funny story how, how we actually came across it. I actually happened across it by chance. Um, and we learned about, you know, all to do with the gut health and things like that. So uh, that's how we came across fermentation. So in the real world, um, even though in the Bible, uh, leaven is talked about in the negative way, it's used to represent something negative. In the real world, it's actually something very good. Um, it, it, when leaven, you want the leaven to leaven the whole lump and, and change the food. Um, but let's see um, why it's used in the negative sense, because negative things have this same attribute as leaven does. Um, let's go to Matthew 16. We'll see the first type of leaven in the Bible that we need to be aware of. Um, Matthew 16 verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening ye, ye say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be foul weather. Today for the sky is red and lowering. 
Oh, you hypocrites. <clears throat> you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the time? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand? That I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should be ware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadduc Sadducees. Then understood they that how he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So the first leaven we see in the Bible that we need to be aware of is false doctrine. So Jesus is saying here that they, they need to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said, and they're thinking, you know, is he saying that because we didn't bring any bread? And he's saying, well, obviously, you know, did you see I, I fed 5,000 and I fed 4,000? Um, I'm not talking about the bread. And then they understand that he's not telling them to beware of the leaven of bread because there's nothing wrong with that. He's saying to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So one leaven we need to be aware of is false doctrine. Now let's go to Galatians 5 and we'll see a link up here because the number one false doctrine that we need to be aware of, of course, is work salvation. Work salvation is the example used in the Bible of false doctrine and it is linked up with leaven. I'll show you here in Galatians 5 uh, verse 1 um, and we'll just read a bit here. It says here, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And that's true, you know, like if somebody believes they have to do any amount of work for their salvation, Christ doesn't profit you anything. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is everything salvation. He's the only way for salvation. All your trust needs to be on Him completely. It can't be on Jesus 99.9% .9 and 0.01% in your works. Because if it is, Christ isn't profiting you. You only have two choices. It's either all Jesus or it's all your works. That's why the Bible says here, I testify again to every man that is circumcised. This is the, the example used here that people believed they were trying to teach that you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. He says here that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So he's saying here, if you think you have to do one work in order to be saved, you actually have to do every work to be saved because you're under the law. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're no longer, longer under the law. Now you're under grace. So they, those are your two options. You can't be in between. Um, you know, Romans uh, eleven six. you know, if it be of works, then it is no more of grace, otherwise work is no more work. Uh, but if it be of grace, then it is no more work, otherwise grace is no more grace. Um, verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So he's saying, see, in Jesus Christ, you're saved. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. That's not going to change whether or not you're saved. It's your faith on Jesus Christ. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. So he's saying you didn't learn this from Jesus Christ. You learned it from somebody else because he says, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You learned this from a man. You didn't learn this from the word of God. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. And look at this. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So false doctrine here is, is shown uh, to act like leaven, where when leaven takes hold in a lump, it starts to spread. And we have to do something to stop that. And that is what we see these days. We see work salvation spreading through churches. We see, you know, this doctrine of having to re repent or turn from your sin to be saved. I mean, you go and talk to, to bishop after bishop after bishop and how many of them will tell you, yes, you have to turn from your sins to be saved. And these were churches that were once preaching salvation by faith. Um, and and I, I'm not exactly sure where they're getting it from, but people must not be reading their Bible and realizing what repentance really is. 
and it spreads like leaven from one church to another to another till the whole lump is, is leavened. And, uh, and that's the danger of churches being in these denominational yokes, even though they don't consider themselves denominations. They get together and they're really close and they care what each other thinks because what happens is, is when one person makes a stand for the truth, he gets ostracized by the rest. And um, should he care? He shouldn't care, but unfortunately they, they, they do. So we see how this false doctrine can spread through churches. You know, work salvation is, is a good example. You know, other examples of uh, leaven that we have to be aware of is, I've just got a couple listed here. You know, the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is that, you know, if you give, God will give back to you in this world, right? Um, you know, blessing by obedience. You know, I think that's a false doctrine that creeps into churches and it gives people, um, it removes their assurance of salvation. It thinks, makes them think that God does not love them because they're not obedient. And, you know, who, who is obedient enough for God, to be under the blessing of God? If the blessing of God as a believer is earned by obedience, then who's got the blessing? You know, and this is why it's a bit hypocritical for somebody to believe they are under God's blessing by their works when none of us are perfect. Um, when the blessing of God is by faith because it cannot be of works. Um, you know, another one is, uh, you know, works-based assurance. You know, knowing that you're saved because of works. You know, automatic justification. You know, if you, you're saved, you'll just automatically change and automatically walk in the Spirit. Or, you know, another one is uh, predestination. And these are all linked into salvation, you know, assurance of salvation. These are very important doctrines. And they get in, and sometimes when people don't notice, people just start thinking and believing that way and talking that way and it starts to, like the Bible says, leaven the whole lump. Now what's another type of leaven? Let's go to um, Luke 12. This is a uh, second type of leaven to be aware of. In the meantime, when they were gathered, when they were gathered together in a numerable, numerable multitude of people in so much that they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. So the second type of leaven we want to be aware of is hypocrisy. And what is hypocrisy? We see a definition in Matthew 23. Jesus says here, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, this, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And if you know chapter 23 of Matthew, it's when Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees for being hypocrites. And he defines it here, I believe, in the first couple of verses where he says the Pharisees, they say and they do not. Because that's what being a hypocrite is. Being a hypocrite is when you say you're doing something, but you're not actually doing it. Now, hypocrisy is not believing something is right and not doing it. Because then otherwise you, you could never not be a hypocrite, right? Because if we believe we ought to be perfect and holy and none of us are, I mean, you'd, you would never ever not be a hypocrite, right? A, hip, a hypocrite is not somebody that believes something is wrong and then doesn't do it themselves. I believe a hypocrite is somebody that says they are doing it, but they're not doing it, right? It, it's, it's like somebody, um, uh, what example do I have here? So, here's a prime example, right? We, we just talked about work salvation. Somebody that says, I've repented of my sins. That person's a hypocrite because nobody has repented of all their sins. If they've repented of all their sins, why do they still sin? Do you know what I mean? So that's hypocrisy for somebody to say, I have repented of all my sin. I've made Jesus Lord of my life. Yes, we strive to make Jesus Lord of my life, but it's something that we strive for. But for somebody to say, I have done that, why do they still sin? Jesus said, you know, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? So we, Jesus is not the Lord of our life if we're still sinning, because there's a part of us that we are still the Lord of our life. Or people that say, you know, I think this is hypocritical. They may not think they're being hypocritical, but people that say, oh, I, don't, I, you know, they believe in Calvinism and they say, well, I just automatically do right. Because they don't just automatically do right. Because why do they still sin? Because if they just automatically did right, automatically walk in the Spirit just because they're saved, why are they still sinning? So obviously they don't automatically just do right because there are, there are times where they don't do right. Um, and they make choices in their life. And I already touched on this one, you know, I'm blessed by God by my obedience. I believe 
That's a hypocritical statement because they're not blessed by God by their obedience because nobody is obedient enough to, to be under the blessing of God in the Old Testament sense. So this is a, the second type of leaven we ought to be aware of. So number one was false doctrine. Number two is hypocrisy, saying... Um, so false doctrine is what is wrong, right? Hypocrisy is thinking that you're doing right, but you're actually doing wrong. And the last one we just want to look at. Uh, let's just go to... Actually, I wanted to show you these verses in 1 Corinthians 5. I'll just show you, before I move on to the third one, the, this, um, more verses to do with this hypocrisy. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, it says here, it is, reported, uh, commonly, co it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? So you see here how we see the hypocrisy, I believe, of the Corinthian church um, being likened to leaven. Because why, why do I believe that they were being hypocritical? Because you see how it says here in verse 2, it says, And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned. So there's this fornication going on in the church. In verse 6 we see, Your glorying is not good. So I sort of asked myself, well, what, were the Corinth what was the Corinthian church being puffed up about and being so uh, self-glorifying about if they had fornication rampant in their church? And what I imagine is, Nowadays, like you see churches where people are just worldly, people are living in fornication. But what do the, the churches in the New Age movement say? Look how loving we are. We're so loving that we just allow all the homosexuals and all the, you know, the fornicators and the adulterers within our church because, you know, the church is a hospital for sinners. And this is how we, we, it just shows how much of a loving church we are and how, you know, so they're puffing themselves up over the wrong thing. Because Paul is saying here, you know, you've allowed this fornication to run rampant in your church and you're puffed up about it rather than mourning about it that he that had done this thing might be taken away from you. Because instead of glorifying and in how inclusive you are and how you want everyone here, it doesn't matter, we take, take you as you are even though there are certain sins that ought to get you removed from a church, they're glorifying in the fact that people are actually there that are doing these things rather than mourning and trying to get that sin out of the church. Um, so they're being hypocritical. And this is why I think it's, it's likened unto leaven. <clears throat> now, the other thing in here, so not only do I think the Corinthian church is being hypocritical here because they're saying that they're being loving when they're not being loving because the actual thing that they should be doing is um, uh, getting that sin out of the church. <clears throat> the other leaven I think we need to be aware of, which is similar and sort of linked into the same, is just blatant sin in and of itself, right? Uh, let's continue to read on here in 1 Corinthians 5. So he says here in verse 6, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, there, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So you see, again, it's linked up with false doctrine and the truth, right? Because malice is when you want to do something evil towards somebody else. And wickedness is things that are sinful. Uh, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, so when you do something it's sincerely, it's when you do something lovingly and with the right intention and in truth. So we see there the, the opposite, malice, wickedness, and sincerity and truth. So he says, I wrote unto you, in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, 
or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat? For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do, no, do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So we see here in the Bible that churches are not just meant to be anything goes. Yes, we're all sinners, but there are certain sins that will get you kicked out of a church. And to be honest, you know, if I find out things like these are happening in church, I, I will approach you. So it's not that I know anything like this is going on in church, but you need to know that if I find out things like this, I will approach you about it. And I don't want to approach you about it. I'd rather that you know it says this in the Bible and just not do it, right? And then keep our church unleavened. But there are certain things in here, and we see the list here, you know, but now I have written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. So fornication, obviously sexually immoral practices. Um, people that are, you know, doing things they shouldn't be outside of marriage. Um, covetous, people that are just, that's all they talk about. They're materialistic and they're greedy. Um, an idolater is uh, probably self-explanatory if you're, if you're worshipping idols. So a, a railer, a railer is somebody that is just uh, saying negative things about other people all the time. Um, a drunkard, somebody has wine in excess. An extortioner, somebody has, you know, uh, like blackmailing people, has, uh, you know, I think immoral business practices. These are the sort of people where, you know, and I, and I don't believe you just get kicked out at the first sign of it. There is a, there is a, a method where you approach the person one-on-one -on -one and then three two or three witnesses, and then it's brought before the church. So there is a, uh, a, a you know, like a, a method of escalation to escalate these things. But these are things you ought to be aware of because God saw it fit to name these things because these were serious enough to say, hey, if people within the church are doing these things, get that out of the church because it's going to leaven the whole lump. So there are certain sins that should get a person excommunicated, would be the word that most people use. And, you know, why? Because, you know, in a world where the church is not the government, that, that's all you have left, really. Because you can't punish people criminally. You can't execute people for doing things wrong, right? So th all you have left is to disfellowship them and say, you know what, we, we, it's, it's not that we don't love you. It's not that we don't want you here. It's that if you're not going to get right and stop doing what you're doing, we're not going to let you leaven the lump. Right? Because we've got children here. We've got, we want to create an environment that is godly for people. That's what the whole purpose of church. But if church is just allowed to let the leaven of sin just run rampant, then what is the church anymore? It's meant to be a haven from the world. But if we let it become just like the world, then it's, it's removing one of its purposes. So those are the three leavens we can see in the Bible. We see the false doctrine. We see uh, hypocrisy which is, you know, saying you're doing something and you're not actually doing it. And then we just see the blatant sin, the malice and the wickedness um, that is allowed to go rampant in a church and, and, um, and spread and multiply and infect other people. Now, what are some spiritual lessons we can learn from leaven? So remember, in the real world, leaven was good. So we want to encourage it to multiply and to, to, to produce because we want it to, to leaven our food. But in, in the church, we see here uh, in verse... Uh, there we go. Seven. He says here, uh, Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. So the church here is actually used in the analogy like we are a lump of dough, right? All of us together. We're a lump of dough and we need to keep this dough unleavened. So what I was thinking about is what are the factors that help leaven to thrive in the real world and maybe we can learn something about how we can deal with leaven in a church. And let me t tell you a couple of them. Now, number one is when you want to ferment something, um, you need to keep it in the dark. In, in the dark. Uh, and, and why is that? Because UV light actually destroys the bacteria and the yeast and will actually cause them to die so that they don't ferment. That's why whenever you make bread and you leaven it, they tell you to put it into a dark place. They put, put a cover over it. It allows the yeast to work and to, to create the carbon dioxide that actually rises that bread. That, that was something I didn't know about bread. Did you know that the, the, when, you, when you eat bread and it's all like holy and got the airs in, that's actually created from the carbon dioxide that comes off the yeast? I didn't know that. I didn't know how they, they made it all spongy, but that's what it is. So as the yeast 
um, consumes the sugars, it creates carbon dioxide and that carbon dioxide is what is actually pushing the bread up because it's creating all that gas inside and actually creates the pattern within the bread. And that's why they like the baker's yeast, right? Because they use baker's yeast, it's a very consistent bubbling. But with, when you see a sourdough, sometimes you cut it open and there's like a big hole in it because you know, it's not consistent with how it's creating the gas. So um, what was my point? So my point is you, you, when you want to leaven something in the real world, you put it in the, in the dark because light is going to kill it. So what can we learn? What, what spiritual application can we, can we apply to that? Well, if leaven, if the, if the sin and the false doctrine is multiplying in a church, how do we kill it? Well, we kill it with extra light, right? So we're going to kill physical leaven with physical light. One way we can hinder the process of spiritual leaven is with spiritual light. And what is spiritual light? Well, let's go to um, John 1. And obviously you guys know this, and we're just going to show a couple of verses to you. You might, you might not know this, but John 1. Um, let's just read from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So we see here that Jesus Christ is that light. Jesus Christ is the word of God. We see here in Psalm 119, 105 as well as the famous verse. It says here, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Second uh, Peter 1. 16. Look at what Peter says here. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So he's talking about here his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw the Lord Jesus transfigured before him. He says, we saw Christ in his majesty. We heard the, the voice of the Father. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Mount. But look at this. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that ye take heed. So he says, you take heed unto the word, the sure word of prophecy. And look at this as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So here Peter is saying, even more sure than his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration is the word of God, is the, the sure word of prophecy, which is the scripture, and he says, take heed unto it because it's like a light that's shining in a dark place. So you can see here that, you know, if we want to kill the spiritual leaven, we need to shine light on the spiritual leaven. We need to preach the word of God. We need to know the word of God because that's going to expel the false doctrine. That's going to kill off the sin. Because if you don't know you're doing wrong when you're doing it, how is it going to get purged out of your life? Right? And this is what the light is. The Bible says, whatsoever doth make manifest is light and this is why preaching can't just be a shallow emotionally driven sermon it needs to be something that actually teaches you something that that like the bible says preach the word and and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering we need to explain these things to people and explain them the word of god so it shines light into the church it shines light into people's lives so they can purge out this leaven they can kill this leaven that is not in, only infecting their own life but it's spreading and leavening the lump of the church. And you know, this is why it never, it, it never sat well with me. Because you know when you go to some churches, on Sunday morning when everybody's there, what do you normally get? You normally get the feel good, you know, one that encourages you and pats you on the back type of sermon. Um, and then you ask them, well, wh why don't you preach something a bit more heavy on Sunday morning? And what's usually the response? Oh, it's because that's when the visitors come. That's when the new people are there. And then normally if you want to go and get the meaty Bible study sermons, when do you go? You've got to go on the Wednesday night or the Sunday night. 
And it always boggled my mind, why is the most important things that are preached preached when the least people are there? You know, like if something is important and something you need to know, wouldn't, wouldn't you preach it at the gathering you have when everyone's there? And then preach the not so important things when other people, you know, preach the extra things that are maybe additional or secondary on the other nights. So, you know, this is why on Sunday morning I try to, and I know we only have one time a week here, but I try to give you something that's a bit heavier because this is when everyone's here. If everyone's here, why not say something that is actually a bit, a, a bit heavier and teaches you something? Um, so this is, this is one way. So one way to allow leaven to thrive is you leave it in a dark place, right? So we get some light onto the leaven, we can kill the leaven. Spiritual leaven can be killed with spiritual light. Now what's another factor that uh, helps leaven to grow? Another factor is the temperature of the leaven, right? Now this is an interesting one because when, when, you, when you want something to leaven, right, and something to ferment, you can't have it too hot or too cold, right? Because if you have it too hot, it kills the leaven. But if you have it too cold, the leaven won't, won't do its thing. It will actually hinder the leavening process. So what do you have to do? You have to have it lukewarm. So when we think about this in a church environment, what allows leaven to thrive? It's a lukewarm environment, isn't it? Now, let's go to Revelation 3. I'm trying to show you where I'm going with this. When we think about lukewarmness, the verse we would go to is the Laodicean church in Revelation. Look at this. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, so he's saying here, I would thou wert cold or hot, saying I want you to be either cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So, <clears throat> so, God is saying here, being lukewarm is when you're neither cold nor hot. Um, let's just read on because I wanted to get to a verse further down. He says, Because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So here's the, the hypocrisy, right, that we talked about. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, and thou, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So we see here the counsel of Jesus Christ is that like that light that's, that's going to these guys. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now look at this. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So what was the, the, the solution to being lukewarm? It's to be zealous. So when I think of physical heat affecting physical leaven, what is the spiritual heat that's going to affect the spiritual leaven? It's the zealousness, right? The passion for the truth. So if everyone in church is zealous and passionate, it's going to be a hot environment, right? And the hot environment is not going to allow the, ve the leaven to reproduce and to multiply because it's going to kill it. Now, What's interesting about leaven is if you go the opposite way, if you go cold, it doesn't actually kill the leaven. Because what you can actually do with sourdough starter or kefir grains, you can actually freeze that and put it in the freezer. And then once you've defrosted it, put it back into a lump. And once it gets back to a warm temperature, it'll start, it'll revive and it'll start to multiply again. Now, isn't that interesting? If you put it into heat, it kills it. But if you put it into cold, it doesn't actually kill it. It just hinders the process. And that's the same in a church, isn't it? When everyone's just cold, maybe that's why Jesus is saying, I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. Because when you're lukewarm, that allows the leaven to just multiply and multiply and multiply. But when you're cold, at least it's going to hinder that leaven. Because you know, churches that don't care about the truth, they don't care about soul, they don't care about anything. Nothing's going to spread in that church because they don't care about anything. Right? So when, when, when a church is cold, false doctrine and sin is not going to spread because they don't care about anything. Right? It's because they're not talking about the Bible. They're talk um, but when, and when, when a church is hot, they care about things. That's where you know, somebody says something false. Somebody's going to correct them. We're going to correct one another. We're going to sharpen each other and keep the heat up in this church. But what, what is lukewarm? Lukewarm could be everyone's half in, half out. But think about this. Lukewarm could be everybody's cold. And there's just a little group in the church that's hot. 
right? Have you ever seen that in a church where the rest of the church is cool, cool, cold, right? They don't care about anything. They're just going along with the flow. But then there's this little group in the church that gets on fire for God. And what's, da what's dangerous there is if they get on fire with the false doctrine. And I've seen that happen in churches when there's this little group, you know, they want to serve God, they want to get on fire for God, and they get involved with the ministry like Living Waters or Way of the Master. And they're like, hey, we're going to get this soul winning fired back up in church. And they bring in all the Living Waters and all the Ray Comfort and Paul Washer and blah, blah, blah. And they bring it in. And what happens? A false gospel starts getting preached. And then it spreads throughout the church because it's, now, it's, now it's lukewarm. Because now you've got cold and hot people mixed all together. And now that leaven is able to spread and leaven the whole lump. So that's an interesting thing about um, the heat of leaven. That hot will kill it. Cold just stops it for a minute. But once you get that temperature back up to lukewarm, it'll revive and it'll um, spread throughout the church. <clears throat> So like, just like everything else in life, you know, when it comes to temperature, you know, everything tends, to tends towards room temperature, doesn't it? If you leave something out that's hot, it'll tend towards room temperature. If you leave something that's cold, it'll also tend towards room temperature. This is why we have to be careful because if we don't do anything about the leaven and we don't do anything about the temperature of this church, it'll automatically, because of sin, just tend towards room temperature. So you've got to think about your own life, you know, how do you apply this to yourself? You know, what sort of temperature are you adding to this church? Are you adding cold to this church or are you adding heat to this church? Because even though some of us might be hot, if you're coming in cold, you're just bringing us closer to being lukewarm. And it's like I talked about a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember, but you know, even the church is like a ground and we're all planted in this ground. And, and we're not an island, we, we affect the church in one way or another. Because even though a, a tree might be planted in the ground and not fruitful, it still takes up space in the ground, it still takes sunlight that other trees could have got, it still takes nutrients from the soil. So what I'm saying is in this church there's no neutral position. You need to think about how your life is affecting the rest of the church because it will. It'll either have a positive effect or it'll have a negative effect. What sort of effect do you want to have on this church? Um, are you adding heat or cold to the church's temperature? How are you encouraging or discouraging the leaven that is in this church? Because we're not perfect, right? There's always going to be leaven in this church. What are you doing to hinder it, kill it, or um, make it continue to multiply? Now, the third factor when it comes to leaven, um, so you've got, you need to keep leaven. If, so if you want to ferment, you don't need to do these things. If you, don't want, if you don't want the church to ferment, you need to stop these things. So with, with ferment, fermentation, you want to keep it in a dark place. You need to keep it in a lukewarm environment that allows that um, leaven to grow. The other thing you have to do with leaven is you need to have it in an anaerobic environment. Now, there's anaerobic and an aerobic environment. Now, when we think of aerobics, you know, we think of the you know, one, two, thing. So the reason why that's called aerobics is because it's getting your breathing up, right? Getting more oxygen into your body. Now, anaerobic is a, where, in an environment where there's no oxygen. Now, when it comes to fermenting, you want to keep the ferment in, in an anaerobic environment. You need to keep the oxygen out. That's why when you see fermentation vessels, there's always that little airlock on the top that has water in it. Because what that does is it allows the carbon dioxide that is produced from the leaven to escape the vessel, but doesn't allow oxygen to get into the vessel because the oxygen will cause the bacteria and the yeast to oxidize and actually kill off the fermentation process. Now, how do we apply this to spiritual leaven? Now, I don't know if this is stretching the analogy too far, but you know, when I think of oxygen, I think of breathing, right? Because we breathe in oxygen, the breath of life. Now, the Bible says, uh, he that, uh, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So when we think about the breath of life in a church, what is that? It's the multiplication, right? It's, it's people being alive and wanting to bring forth new life. So I think the oxygen, when it comes to leaven, could be compared to how alive a church is in a sense of, is it bringing forth new life? Because just like the Bible says that Sarah's womb was dead because it was barren, it didn't bring forth new life, a church can be dead not because it's not saved, it's just not bringing forth new life. Now churches that are starved of oxygen right? They tend to leaven a lot quicker, right? Because when they don't have a focus on soul winning, they don't have a focus on bringing forth new life, the, the malice and wickedness increases. 
Don't you find that in churches? When they don't have a greater goal to keep everyone in one direction, they start bickering amongst each other. They start bickering amongst um, each other about false doctrine. And I'm not saying that false you know, doctrine is not important, but when you have a greater goal, sometimes you can put those differences aside and still work together. Because it's sad when you see people, and there's already so little of us, fighting over one another and, 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 and separating from one another when we have a greater enemy. You know, that, I mean, how, I mean let's, let's band together against Islam. Let's band together against Buddhism. Let's band together against these others. And I'm not saying that false doctrine is not a big deal. But there are some things where even if you disagree on a doctrine, and maybe if, it, if it's a major one, the life in a church, the goal to bring forth new life and get other people saved can, can be a way to stamp out that leaven of malice and wickedness. Um, so I just think it's interesting that, you know, fermentation requires an oxygen-free environment. It's to do with breathing. The Bible talks about the breath of life. Um, you know, it's no soul winning gets people debating and separating over doctrine. Um, soul winning gives people a higher goal, which encourages them to put their differences aside. And, you know, two, sometimes two people will work together for a greater goal of, of bringing life into the world. I mean, think about um, a lot of parents, right? Even though there's strife in, in relationships, sometimes what, what will happen? Parents will say, you know what, we're going to put our differences aside because we want to create an environment for this, for this child to grow up in. And that's why a lot of times if people don't have a healthy relationship, they get divorced after the children leave the home because they were at least willing to put their differences aside. They were at least willing to make things work for the children. And it's sort of like that in a church. You know, we bicker and, and we don't, we're not um, mature about how to deal with our differences. Uh, you know, we're going to affect the younger people in the church, like the younger people who are uh, younger spiritually. And sometimes those of us who are more mature, we have to bear the infirmities of the week, right? We have to try and get along and, and have that environment. So th this church is a place where the younger people can grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, you know, this, this is um, like my relationship with my sending church. Because, you know, a lot of people thought when I started this church, I came out and all of a sudden I just changed. Like, as though I was just pretending to be somebody I wasn't at my old church. And then when I started this church, I changed. And the reason why they have that impression is because a lot of them didn't know me, right? They didn't know what I believed. They didn't know what I stood for and the, the plans that we had for this church. But the people at Lighthouse Baptist Church did know. So it wasn't a surprise to them. And it's funny because I, I haven't put this online and, and um, I didn't put this on, on, on the internet. But um, at my ordination um, um, service, uh, one of the men of the church actually stood up and gave a testimony about me. And, and the thing that he actually shared was, you know what? Victor came. He was different but he could put those differences aside because he wanted to, to work in this church and get people saved. And that was the testimony I had in that church. They, they knew I was different. They knew I didn't believe everything I did, but they knew that I put all that aside because I wanted to get people saved. We, we, that was the greater thing. So I, I didn't mind dealing with the things I didn't agree with in that church and, and, and dealing with the things that, 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 we, that we didn't agree with because I had a, I had a greater goal in mind. Um, I had, a, I had a, a greater purpose that I wanted to achieve and that was to get people saved and I was willing to put those things aside in order to uh, accomplish that. So you can see how if there's life in a church that can hinder uh, and even kill off the spiritual leaven in a church. Now the last two things I just want to say, these are not really factors that, that help leaven to thrive. So if you remember those three factors, it's dark place, lukewarm, and um, oxygen free environment. The other two things I thought were interesting um, just to do with fermentation that I thought of. The, the way fermentation works, the bacteria in the yeast, the, the way they actually multiply is they consume the sugars in that food. And that's why, you know, yogurt without sugar is sour, right? You know, you buy natural yogurt, it's like soured because it's soured milk. Yogurt is just a bit different. I think they use a different starter and at a certain temperature so that they can create that nice consistent creaminess. But um, basically when you ferment something, it becomes sour. That's why kimchi is sour, sauerkraut is sour. Anything that you ferment, you know, uh, fruit wines will turn into vinegar, they'll sour uh, because it's consuming the sugar in that food. And I just thought, you know, maybe that, that works a bit like, like the church. Whereas, you know, in a church, you don't want this to ferment, right? You want the fellowship to be sweet. You know, we always say that. We want sweet communion with one another. We want, 
We want the, we want uh, you know the, the lump, this dough to be a sw the, the sweet bread, like sweet like honey. But if you allow the leaven to ferment this dough, what happens? It becomes a sour place. It becomes a bitter place, doesn't it? And I was just thinking about that with, with the whole uh, spiritual analogy of leaven, that when malice and wickedness is allowed to multiply within a church, the fellowship is destroyed. And isn't it, right? When, when people are not being spiritual, people are not on the same page, the fellowship is not as sweet. It becomes a bit more sour. So that was uh, one thing I thought of. Uh, you know, Matthew 24, 12, I'll just show you this verse. You know, this is a f famous verse about the end times. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And that's the same in a church. When iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. And, and don't think of iniquity just like the blatant sins like fornication and lying. You know, sometimes the iniquity is just selfishness, right? Because sometimes we, we're, so, we're so concerned with our own affairs, with ourselves, we don't really consider the other people in church. You know, because of this iniquity, this, this pride and self-absorbedness, um, the love of many waxes cold. We, we, we forget to love one another and think about one another. And I'm guilty of this too. You know, obviously I get so, sometimes so caught up with life and even with my own family that I don't always pray for you guys as, as I ought and, 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 and think about you guys as I ought and think of, of how I can be a blessing to the other people. Because this is a one way, right? We can kill that leaven, right? We can kill that leaven and have a, an unleavened lump, remember? With sincerity and truth. Um, we do things for people sincerely. The other thing as well is, um, the, thought, the other thought I had was, you know how fermentation, when you ferment a food, it makes it better. And I just thought, how, how would you apply that spiritually? I just wonder, even though we have sin and there is sin in a church, you know, God can still use that to make us better. And he does, right? He can use the strife. He can use the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the, uh, I guess strife, I already used that word. I was looking for another word. The com com conflict, right? Conflict um, between us to, to actually make us more nutritious. You know, so that might be another application where you know, even though we're not perfect, even though this leaven will be there, um, it, it could actually make us better. So maybe when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like unto a woman that hid leaven in three measures of meal, there could be both applications. Because we should be beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, which is the hypocrisy, the false doctrine, the, the sin, which will multiply. But also the other way around as well, that, the, 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 that, that conflict can actually make us better and actually uh, increase the nutritional content of this dough that we are part of here. So what's the conclusion? So I hope, hope that was a bit of an interesting application for you, learned a bit about leaven, um, learn how we can spiritually apply it and um, even learn a bit about being healthy. Um, but remember, we read here in 1 Corinthians 5 that the church is like a lump of dough, isn't it? So whereas normally you would want to encourage fermentation, um, but spir spiritually we're seeking to, to hinder or to stop this unleavened bread so that we'll be a, a, an un stop this leavened bread so that we'll be a, a lump of unleavened bread. So if you consider these conditions that we've talked about, and what they could possibly represent spiritually. Um, you know, what's your contribution to the spiritual environment of this church? Um, is it making us darker, less oxygen, more lukewarm, or is your life helping to hinder the leaven um, by shining the light, you know, turning up the heat in your life, um, you know, breathing more oxygen into this church or, you know, you know keeping the fellowship sweet? So... Just think about that application. Just think about how, it's, how your life is affecting this church. And I hope that you know, compels you to, to want to um, change the way you're living. All right, let's pray. I mean, Lord, we thank you for your word. Um, we thank you that we can learn these spiritual lessons from the physical applications in this world. Um, we thank you, Lord, for many of the healthy things we can eat in this world um, that we can enjoy. Pray, Lord, that you'd keep us all in good health. Help us to take care of our bodies so that we could be a, a vessel that is more fit to serve you for longer. And uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you that you died for us. Thank you that through your spirit we can be an unleavened church spiritually um, and help us, Lord, to just kill off the, the leaven that could possibly multiply within us. We praise you. We thank you in, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I hope you learned something today. And let's uh, start getting ready for lunch.